The direct method is to identify actual cash inflows and outflows, while the indirect method is to begin with net income and make necessary adjustments to get the CFO. Let's compare the two methods. Under the direct method, an accrual basis income statement is converted into a cash basis cash flow statement. Recall that under the accrual method of accounting, the timing of revenue and expense recognition may differ from the timing of related cash flows. Under cash basis accounting, revenue and expense recognition occur when cash is received or paid. So you can see, the revenue and expenses accounted for on accrual basis and the actual cash received and expensed can be vastly different. Conversely, you can also see the similarities of the income statement and direct method cash flow presentation. The direct method begins with cash inflows from customers and then deducts cash outflows for purchases, operating expenses, interest and taxes. Under the indirect method, the net income from the income statement is converted to operating cash flow. This is done by making adjustments for transactions that are non-cash but affect net income. Such adjustments include eliminating non-cash expenses like depreciation and amortization, non-operating items like gains and losses, and changes in balance sheet accounts resulting from accrual accounting events. Total cash flow from operating activities is exactly the same under both methods. The primary advantage of the direct method is that it presents the firm's operating cash receipts and payments, while the indirect method only presents the net result of these receipts and payments. Therefore, the direct method provides more information than the indirect method. This knowledge of past receipts and payments is useful in estimating future CFO. The main advantage of the indirect method is that it focuses on the differences in net income and CFO. This provides a useful link to the income statement when forecasting future CFO. Analysts may find it easier to forecast net income and then derive the CFO by adjusting net income for the differences between accrual accounting and cash basis accounting. Companies often only disclose indirect operating cash flow information. Analysts, on the other hand, prefer direct format information. As such, analysts often approximate the direct cash flow statement from the available financial statements. We shall go through the steps to prepare the cash flow statement from the income statement and balance sheet. The first step is to determine the cash received from customers. From the income statement, we have the revenue. The revenue is the total sales made in the period. Based on accrual accounting, the revenue consists of sales made in cash and sales made on credit. On the balance sheet from the previous period, part of the accounts receivable was repaid by the customers during the year. The rest was carried over to the current balance sheet. What we're interested in, in the CFO, is the total cash collections from customers for this period. This consists of sales in cash for the period and the accounts receivable that have been repaid by the customers for the period. This amount can be calculated by subtracting the revenue from the income statement by the increase in accounts receivable from the balance sheet. Plugging in the figures, we get a total of $99,000 cash collected from customers. The second step is to determine the cash paid to suppliers. From the income statement, the cost of goods sold gives us an idea of the purchases made from suppliers for the period. The goods sold during the period can either come from inventory or direct from suppliers. Therefore, if the inventory has decreased during the period, the decrease in inventory must have been sold if there were no write-offs. The balance must have been purchased from suppliers. Therefore, the purchases made during this period is the cost of goods sold minus the decrease in inventory. However, not all the purchases are made with cash. As with the principle of accrual accounting, part of these purchases could be made on credit. At the same time, some of the accounts payable from the previous period could have been repaid to the suppliers. The cash paid during this period is therefore made up of the purchases made in cash, 
and the amount of accounts payable that was repaid. This can be calculated by the total purchases minus the increase in accounts payable or the cost of goods sold minus the decrease in inventory minus the increase in accounts payable for the period. Plugging in the figures, we get a total of $34,000 paid to suppliers. The third step is to calculate the cash paid for operations. From the income statement, we have the sales, general and admin, which is the operational expenses made during the period. Based on accrual accounting, the SG&A consists of expenses paid in cash and expenses paid on credit. On the balance sheet from the previous period, part of the accrued liabilities was repaid during the year. The rest was carried over to the current balance sheet. What we're interested in in the CFO is the total cash paid for operations for this period. This consists of expenses in cash for the period and the accrued liabilities that have been repaid for the period. This amount can be calculated by subtracting the SG&A by the increase in accrued liabilities for the period. Plugging in the figures, we get a total of $8,500 cash paid for operations during this period. You can probably see the pattern by now. The cash paid for interest is the interest expense minus the increase in interest payable for the period. Plug in the figures and we get a net cash paid of $0 for the period. The cash paid for taxes is the tax expense minus the increase in taxes payable minus the increase in deferred tax liabilities for the period. Plug in the figures and we get a net cash paid of $14,000 for the period. Summing up all the cash inflows and cash outflows for the period, we get a total operating cash flow or CFO of $42,500. Preparing the indirect cash flow statement is vastly different from that of the direct statement. We begin with net income and adjust it for differences between accounting items and actual cash receipts and disbursements. Depreciation, for example, is deducted in calculating net income but requires no cash outlay in the current period. Therefore, we must add depreciation to net income for the period in calculating operating cash flow. Proceeds from the sale of fixed assets are an investing cash flow. Since gains are a portion of such proceeds, we need to subtract them from net income in calculating CFO under the indirect method. Conversely, a loss would be added back to net income in calculating operating cash flow. Under the indirect method, we also need to adjust net income for change in balance sheet accounts. A quick way to remember polarities is to adjust for a decrease for assets and adjust for increase for liabilities. In summary, the steps in calculating CFO under the indirect method are as follows. Step 1. Begin with net income. Step 2. Eliminate depreciation and amortization by adding them back. These are expenses where cash was not dispensed. Step 3. Eliminate gains by deducting them and losses by adding them back. These are CFI items, not CFO. Step 4. Add or subtract changes to balance sheet operating accounts as follows. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At PrepNuggets, let us do the hard work for you.